Does this sound familiar? You've got your entire classroom set up with all of the most wonderful centers. You've got them fully stocked and loaded. You've spent a lot of money and a lot of time cutting out, laminating, and just curating all the perfect stuff for each center. It's just fabulous. And your kids don't want to go to certain centers. Maybe it's a few months into the school year and your kids only want to go to blocks in dramatic play or whatever your most popular centers are. What do you do when that happens? You see, one of our Trailblazer members asked this question in our supportive community, and I thought you'd be interested in hearing the answers as well. So here is the question Jennifer asked in our group. I've incorporated an alphabet center this year, and I've made the most of the alphabet ideas Vanessa has taught us. So far, my kids have very little interest in this center. It's on a table, in the center of the room, with easy access to everything. They all want to do the activity when I do it with them in small group. But then they just want to play in the centers like dramatic play, Legos, or sensory. Any ideas on how to get them to do all these great things that I've created or bought? Does that sound familiar to anyone out there? Let me know if you're watching on YouTube in the comments below if you have ever had that same experience because a lot of our members have as well. So let me tell you a little bit more about Jennifer for some context. So she teaches a mixed class, mixed age group of children ages three to five. She has one class on Tuesday, Thursday, and another class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. She only sees her kids a few times a week, and each time she sees them, it's only for three hours at a time. Here are my first initial thoughts, and we'll get into the different things that I suggested for Jennifer and some of the things that our other students suggested as well. So my first thought was, was, have you tried previewing the centers every Monday? Like for example, and this week over in the math center, we have this super fun apple game that we played last week in small group. I take out the apple game, I hold it up for all the students to see, and then I'll remember something accidentally on purpose, right? I remember last week that Zoe and Aiden, they had a great time playing this game. Do you remember that too? Not along, because you want them to remember with you. <laughs> then say, if you want to play the Apple game this week, it's going to be right here. And as you say right here, you walk towards the alphabet center, or whatever you call that in your room, and you put it on the shelf while they watch. And usually I will have something like that, an activity in a tub, an open top container of some sort, whether you use baskets or tubs, whatever. And I will put it on the shelf in the place that it's supposed to go, right? So they can see where it is. And then I'm gonna take it a little step further. And when it's time to go to centers, I'll say, don't forget about the Apple game that's waiting for you. That's one way to preview that, right? And then another thing that I thought about, and you let me know if this rings true for you too, for teachers with class, that only meet two or three times a week. So if you're in that situation where you've got a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and a Tuesday, Thursday, and each time you see them, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday is one class and the Tuesday, Thursday is another. If it's only a couple months into the year, and as I'm recording this, it is only a couple months into the school year, but you might not be watching it at that particular time. So that's why I'm being specific with that. In my everyday class that met every day, Monday through Friday, for three hours, most of my career and then full day towards the end. The novelty for centers didn't wear off after 16 days. Goodness no, it took until at least October for the novelty of those high interest centers to calm down. So your kids would be right on track in my opinion in their still being most interested in those because they've only explored them and played with them a few times. And you also have that drawback of having gaps between the time that your kids come to see you, right? So think about if you've ever taught a class that meets every day. So I'll take my class as an example, my previous classes. If we had a four day weekend, when we came back on Tuesday, I had to review everything. 
because that's a long time in the world of a little kid, right? So think about it. Every week when your kids come to you on Tuesday, you have to revisit things, especially if you're only in the second month or into the third month of the school year. That's a long time for little kids. They haven't got the muscle memory and, and the memory in general and all the rules and routines. Just They're not just not down yet. They're just not ready for that. So I think that is completely normal for being in this point in the school year for children ages three to five to be behaving that way. I think that is completely normal. So don't worry. <laughs> they just need more time. The other thing that I did suggest to Jennifer was that when we're talking about children who are three years old, okay, so we're talking about three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. And what we know about the period of development in children, whether that's academic development or the way their brains grow or their bodies grow, there's a big difference between children ages three, four, and five. I mean, just look at the developmental milestones that's put out by the CDC. They're learning different things at those times. So your three-year-olds, they probably won't seek out those more academic centers like alphabet and math right? Because they're not ready for that type of complexity just yet. Three-year-olds are in more of an exploratory phase, right? Than your fours and your fives. So your threes are going to move more frequently and fluidly throughout the classroom, just because that's where they typically and normally are in their stages of development. And your fours and your fives are going to be a little more advanced in that area. That's something else to think about as well. And now another one of our uh, students gave some advice as well. She said that she combined her writing and her alphabet center into one center. She combined both of the, the shelves and the tables, and now her students use both the centers more often, and they can use those materials interchangeably. And I thought that was one idea that could possibly work also. I've always combined my writing and my art center because so many of the materials cross over. Another member suggested playing in the center with the children to pique their interest. And this is something I also recommend to all of our students. If you have a center that your kids just don't wanna to go to, try playing there. Just go over to that center. And one of the examples I always give is the writing center or the writing slash art center in my case, is if I don't see kids going there, it's because they don't know what to do or they're not familiar with the materials or they're just more attracted to the other centers. So I'll go there and say, you know what? I'll think out loud. I think that, you know, my mom's birthday is tomorrow and I need to make her a birthday card. So I wonder if there's something here that I could use to do that. And I go, oh, look, I found a piece of paper. Sometimes I'm just talking to myself <laughs> and that's okay because they're still listening, even though they might not look like it. And then I just proceed to make my mom a card and some kids will come over and be interested in that. And I'll ask them, are you going to make a card too? What are you going to make? you know, and just kind of let them explore the materials. And I'll just kind of play with them and say, oh, you know what? I use some of these greeting cards here and I cut them all up to make this pretty picture. And now I'm adding some details to my picture with my markers. You want some markers too? Or, you know, I just, I open it up like that. That's one way to do it is to, to play there. Now, you and I both know that we as teachers have a million different things on our plates that we must teach, right? That are demanded of us or expected of us to teach. So we don't all have oodles of time to do this. So I'm not saying you should do this every day. I'm just saying every now and again to draw interest, right? That's one idea. So another thing that Jennifer mentioned in her question was the materials. She said something about how she spent all this money buying things and creating things, and she just wants to know how to utilize these things in a way that her children will be attracted to them or want to use them so that she can actually teach them things in playful ways because she spent a lot of time doing all this. And so one of the things that I like to mention to teachers is the switching out of the materials in your center. So I'm not saying that she hasn't or needs to or anything like that. I'm just saying if we think about switching things out, quite often that can allow us to use the same materials over and over and peak interest. So I have an example for you set up here. So for this activity, I'm going to be using the learning resources 
people counters. And I really love Learning Resources products because they have some of the best math manipulatives out there, in addition to a lot of other really great things in their product lines. I'm not associated with Learning Resources. They don't know me and I don't know them. Um, but I'm certainly open to any partnerships they may have. But what I hear from teachers quite a bit is that my kids just put them all in a pile and make soup, or they make a mess with them, or they don't know what to do with them, or I lose them all the time, all those kinds of things. And I will say that, yes, that's a problem, but it's an easy one to solve. So we talk a lot also in early childhood about switching the materials up on the shelves. And so one way that you can keep things fresh and fun in this case, in your math center, is to switch and rotate out the materials, but you're also gonna use them over and over and over again. So each time they're presented in that center as a free choice or whatever, just you know to have at during center time, your kids are going to be building the number of skills they can practice using those same manipulatives. So for those of you watching along, I have the people counters from Learning Resources is right here on the screen. And if you're listening along, they're just little people <laughs> um, and they're different sizes and different colors. So we've got a green, red, purple, blue, yellow, orange. So lots of bright colors. And the people are, what I really like about this set is that it has different sizes of people. So right there, it gives it a lot more ways to be used, right? Because now we've added not just color, but we've got the type and the size of the people. So here's a baby, we've got a little girl, we've got a taller, what looks like a man, it could be anybody, they have no faces on them, right? So these could be anybody. Um, this is a little, we'll just call him a little boy. Um, we've got little girls, little boys. Uh, we've got what look like men, what look like women, and cats. I love that they have these little cats. That's another reason why I bought this set because I'm a cat lover myself. So we've got all these colorful manipulatives, right? And so the first thing that most people want to do with them in their centers is to have the kids sort them which is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And so very simple on the screen here, I have printed out a picture of a house. This is just a black line drawing. I've printed them out on brightly colored paper that matches the colors of the people. So I've got a green, a yellow, a blue, a red, a purple, and an orange picture of a house, right? So I printed them on colored paper. And the very obvious thing to do in, in the beginning of the year, especially when a lot of people are kind of assessing their children's knowledge of colors and so forth, is to just invite the children to sort the people onto the mats. You can actually just leave it open-ended and let them decide how they want to sort the people on the mats. But if you're watching along, you can see here that I am just sorting the people by color into the little houses, right? So that's one way, and that's the very simple, easy, easy way that you could present this to kids. So let's say that's the first introduction that your kids have to these people. Well, that's great. Then you can put them out in your math center and your kids can do the same, right? They can practice sorting. But you'll notice they start to do other things with the people. <laughs> They're probably gonna be doing a lot of different things with the people. So let's look for all the babies. And let's put the babies right together, right? Now I don't need the colored houses because I'm not sorting the babies by color. I'm sorting them by type, right? And this is another math skill that you will find on almost all early learning standards throughout the US when it comes to the preschool ages. So there we sorted all the babies. Now we can sort all the, the girls wearing skirts or whatever. You can do that. You know, there's a lot of different ways. So you probably notice some of them doing this naturally. But another way to sort would be, let's see, let's line up a set here. And let's line them up according to how tall they are, right? So obviously the baby is the smallest. And then there's the one of the kids, right? There's another kid. There's what looks like a mom and there's what looks like a dad. And now you've lined them all up 
the kids have lined them all up rather in order. That's by size as well. Now they can sort them from shortest, right, to tallest. So now that I've got the babies over here, now I can sort the little boys and the little girls. You know, we can just sort them like that. That's another way to do it. And of course, one of the kids' things they always like to do as well is to pattern with them. So you've got a blue person and a yellow person. You've got a blue person and a yellow person. You've got a blue cat and a yellow person. So we're going blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. So there's all different ways to pattern, of course, when you're doing patterns by color. You could do patterns by type. So you could do two talls and two shorts, right? Now you could do two talls again. So I am just sorting them by their size. So many different ways that you can use these. Another thing that you can do is here I have, for those of you watching along, I have one of those little rainbow things. It's a rainbow stacker. And so this, I'm just going to set it on my table so that the tallest piece is standing up. And now I can do positional words and I'm going to do it with this little girl. So can you show me where the girl is standing on top of the rainbow? Can you put the little girl under the rainbow? Can you put her next to the rainbow? Can you put her behind the rainbow? So this would be like a small group activity where you're practicing positional words or prepositions. And I have all these different pieces of the rainbow. As long as the little girl fits underneath, you can use those pieces in your small groups. I personally like to use um, paper cups when we do uh, positional word activities. Those are super fun or little boxes. You can use a lot of different things for positional words, like to, to put the little manipulatives in, right? They can count sets. Like, I wonder how many of the blue people there are, or the blue characters. So we're gonna put the, all the blue ones here, and now we're gonna count the set, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So there's five blue people, and now we can sort the yellow people and so forth, right? So how many are there? And now we could do, let's say I had strategically only put two yellows out. Let's put these two away. So which house has more, the blue house or the yellow house? Which house has less, right? So now we got more or less. Another idea to use with the paper houses is to put little dots on them, like the dots on a dice. And so here I have a purple house with four dots a yellow house with three, an uh, orange house with five, and a green house with two. So your kids could then match the number of people to the dots. So here I'm gonna do one, two, three, four people on the purple house. And then I can put one, two, hey, do I not have another yellow one? <laughs> I can put three on the yellow house and two on the greenhouse and so forth. And of course you could always print your houses larger so they're, you know, a bigger size so you can make your dots bigger. Another idea, because I love, love, love to incorporate as much three-dimensional stuff, <laughs> as many three-dimensional things as I can into our activities. Your kids could possibly, if they wanted to, make a pattern, right? So let's take red and blue again because those are the color bingo daubers I have. I have a uh, sentence strip here. I always use my sentence strips for patterning just because I think they lend themselves really well to it. And bingo daubers, you know, typically they go through regular paper, but in this case, it's a sentence strip, so not as much. Although this particular bingo dauber that I'm using is a little gooey. And now they can just stamp the matching pattern on their sentence strip. I mean, how cool is that? Now you've got three-dimensional little people, so they're picking up and counting them with their hands, and you've got bingo daubers. I mean, my goodness, do a dot. They're called do a dot markers. So now you're painting. I mean, how much better could it be? So each time I'm doing one of these types of activities, I'm doing it in a small group. I would never do all of these things that I just showed you in one setting with kids. No, each one of these is a separate activity that I'm gonna be doing with kids when 
it's time, when I feel that they're ready, when it's in my curriculum, and so forth. I'm not going to be doing all these at once. I should have said that first. I apologize. This would be seven different times during the year that I was using these counters in my small group math activity. Seven times that they have worked with me in a small group to use these manipulatives. Each time that I meet with them in the small group, right, as our curriculum progresses and as we introduce new skills and learn new things, I will put this on the shelf after we've used it in small group. So let's say the first thing I do is sorting by color. So after we've all done that in a small group with me, I put it on the shelf, right, in my math center. And on that Monday, I usually preview it a little bit and say, remember those people that we played with last week? Remember what we did? Oh, you remember. I walk it over. I do that whole thing. And then I'll let them know that the little people there are in the math center and they can play with them. I'll leave them out there for a couple weeks. I will put them away because I'm not going to go on to any other thing with them just now, right? Maybe I'll leave them there for a few weeks, take them out. And then if they ask me where they are, I'll say, oh, we're going to use those again soon. They'll be back soon. And then maybe it's time for me to start working on patterning. I don't know, <laughs> whatever's in the curriculum at that point. And so I'll get them back out again and we'll do that in a small group. We'll do patterning. And again, it goes on the shelf after we've all had a turn with me. So at the end of the week and everyone has had a chance to work with me in small group, then it goes on the shelf. Now they can do what? They can be sorting them by color and now they can be patterning them too because they've got two different uses. Now, are they going to do other things with them? Of course. If they give them voice and they pretend to talk to each other or whatever, that's fine too. But they've got two experiences using them. And again, and the cycle just repeats itself. So by the time we've got to the seventh activity, my goodness, they know what all the different things they can do with these people. So it, in the beginning, it just feels like it moves slowly. But once you give them a few different times using a particular manipulative, in this case, the learning resources people, this is just one example. You can use this example in with any other manipulative that you have, with any other material. I used the people counters once, and now my kids are bored with them. And I don't have, you know, any money to buy more things this year, but maybe you also have transportation counters so you can take turns swapping those things out. Ideally, you have uh, several other things that you can put in your math center. And I don't want you to think that everything you put in your math center has to be store bought either because rocks can be math manipulatives. Leaves can be math manipulatives. Sticks, you know, uh, natural objects can be uh, manipulatives as well. Wood slices, all of these great things that you find outdoors. Uh, you can use bottle caps. There's lots and lots of different things. So there you have it. I hope that you and Jennifer, if you're listening along, got some great ideas that you can take back and use in your classroom right away to hold interest in your centers in your early childhood classroom. Don't forget, if you have a question that you would like me to answer here on the podcast, all you have to do is go to prekpages.com slash listen and look for the button that says, ask me a question. That's going to let you leave a voicemail for me that I can then use to answer your question here on the air. And you know what? Nobody's going to know if it's your real name or not. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Because I've had some people say, I don't want anyone to know who, where I am. And I'm like, well, that's okay. You don't have to say, you know, I'm Vanessa from Dallas, Texas. You can say, I'm Vanessa from Utah. You know, <laughs> that's up to you. It doesn't matter. What's most important is that we answer your questions. Because this podcast is all about elevating the field of early childhood education. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. Onward and upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.